So with the COVID-19 pandemic, change is happening all around us. Changes rehab family and loved one support group is no different. In order to keep our patients and their families safe, we have moved to an online platform. This will continue to be held for the foreseeable future. We are honored that families and loved ones from all over the world have the opportunity to be present from the safety of your homes. My name is Irene Mitchell, and I would like to welcome you all to the Changes Rehab Family and Loved Ones online support group. This meeting is a reoccurring meeting which will take place on a Tuesday at 6 p.m. South African time. It will run for an hour till 7 p.m. You will be welcome to, you will be welcome to stay behind and chat in the chat room thereafter. We, ob we observe anonymity and confidentiality at this meeting and that nobody is permitted to speak about another person and we ask that you do not gossip. Sorry. This platform is open to learn new ways of dealing with addiction and recovery in a healthy way. Please do not ask us direct questions relating to your loved one. We will, however, answer questions about addiction and recovery. You are probably filled with fear and anxiety and have many questions to ask. Please give this meeting a chance. We may not answer all your questions at once, but you will find that with regular attendance, you will understand more and discover that there is hope to live with and in recover from your loved one's addiction. We may confuse you, we may, you may hear laughter, you may see our tears. This is where we are just for today. We have found that living with addiction is frightening, mortifying, and yet in time, we could eventually accept and understand this disease. We are here for ourselves, for our own recovery, sometimes irrespective of whether our loved one is in recovery or not. As addiction is a lengthy process, so too is recovery. We are unable to offer a quick fix or a miraculous solution. If you are like us, we need to commit to our own recovery process and keep coming back in order for us to have found these solutions. The only advice we are prepared to offer is live just for today. This group is not affiliated with any other group, religious, political, or outside enterprise. We neither endorse nor oppose any cause. What you hear here are our personal experiences and opinions. We feel we have earned the right to say it. We are here to share information, personal experiences, and offer one another hope. We are unable to take responsibility for any decisions you make after hearing about what we have to say or what experiences we have had. This process teaches us to take responsibility for ourselves, our own actions to facilitate change. We're not here to directly change our loved ones. We have discovered that when we begin to do things differently, we heal and our loved ones slowly begin to change. Most of us are here because we see the value in our own healing and our own process of change. We have learned to stop blaming, blaming to get honest and to start communicating in an open, non-violent, non-threatening way. Most of us are here because we see the value in our own healing and our own process of change. We have learned to stop blaming, to get honest and to start communicating in an open, non-violent, non-threatening way. We truly understand what you are going through and we are here to listen and to share. Please do the same. You should find that if you are prepared to listen, you may get some new ideas that will precipitate change. We ask that you refrain from all verbal, physical and emotional abuse with your loved ones. We know that living with addiction is chaotic, but there is no healing if abuse continues from any party. Fundamentally, you are here to change yourselves and stop behaviors that are no longer working for you. These are the only requirements to be part of this group. Confidentiality. Who you see here, what you hear here, please let it stay here. We ask that if you have had any alcohol or drugs within the last 12 hours, kindly do not speak on this meeting platform. We believe it might be the chemicals talking and not you. Each meeting, the host will do a presentation and you're welcome to be present with or without your video on. 
we will allow space for questions before we close. Please raise your hand if you want to speak. We will limit this to two minutes per person. For longer chats, please use the chat room. We will answer questions pertaining to the topic shared on each meeting. Please feel free to contact us via the website www.changesrehab.co.za or via email change at changesrehab.co.za. We will now commence with our meeting and we hope that you get some new ideas to help you to deal with your loved one's addiction. So today I will be presenting on the culture of addiction versus the culture of recovery. And I'd like to start this meeting by defining what culture really is. So we know, you know, the word culture, we don't live in isolation. We live within systems. We, we get our beliefs and our patterns of beliefs and behaviors um, from different systems around us. And these systems have the ability to shape our, our behavior, our worldview. And I think it was Dwight Heath, uh, somebody that really writes on addiction, who said that culture is a guide for action, a cognitive map, and a grammar for behavior. There's also a blueprint which models how we should act. So I thought it might be necessary for us to unpack what actually is the culture of addiction and how the two are opposite of each other, culture of addiction and recovery. So what I'd like to start with is a video. And um, this, is, this video is from a very popular series called Euphoria. And this snippet is based on Rue, one of the main characters in Euphoria. And it's just basically an introductory um, synopsis of who Rue is and what her patterns of addiction has. And I thought is, and I thought it might be good for, for to show actually what the dysfunction of the culture of addiction actually is. So I'm gonna play the video now. Irene, there's no sound, hey? Sorry, Kate? There's no sound. Okay. Try and put the sound up. No, let me, let me play the video. This has happened before. I think it's a setting. I'm going to go in and play the video from my side. Okay.
Okay, so is it playing? Did it, did it play? It didn't play, but you know what? I think the video images was quite um, daunting. Okay. So even without the sound, okay. you could see very daunting images. Okay. okay I'm, I'm just going to uh, play it, Kate. Okay. I'm going to stop my share. You're going to go back to yours. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see the video? No. There's still no sound, so it is what Kate were playing. Irene, you can go on to the next one because I think everybody saw it, but there's just no sound. Okay. Okay, so based on the video, um, I wanted to explore what the culture of addiction really is and unpack this for everybody here tonight. So the culture of addiction is a way of life. It is a way of organizing one's daily experiences, a particular way of viewing or seeing people, events, and the outside world in accordance with the using. It is an informal group where the norm is to encourage excessive substance usage. It has certain shared beliefs, values, customs, traditions, and it has its own rituals and behaviors that evolve over time. Members of a drug culture often share similar ways of dressing, socializing, patterns, languages, style, and style of communication. So I got this excerpt from um, somebody by the name of Gray, who is a recovering heroin addict. I didn't realize how deep into the culture of addiction I had fallen until I ran into an old high school friend. His life was great. He was living the dream. Mine was filled with endless nights of using and hanging out with really bad people with bad attitudes in really scary places. So Gray really outlines, you know, in what she's saying, how her life was, you know, seeing somebody who she was friends in high school with and seeing how his life was, it kind of gave for her perspective on the differences between um, her life in active addiction, what it was like, and those that aren't in active addiction and in the culture of addiction. So hers was filled with partying and centered around using. Until that point, I'd fooled myself. But when I saw my old friend, I was so ashamed. So for Gray, a lot of feelings and emotions came up when she realized that she had to change everything. The culture of addiction is really about neglecting the self holistically, neglecting the body, the soul, the mind. It affects every single part of the addict's life and is the path of destruction. And I want you all to just, you know, if you've got loved ones, you're on this platform, whether they're in recovery, whether they're in active addiction, wherever they are, just some understanding for yourself around, you know, what you identified about their using and perhaps their culture in addiction. Were they out late? Were they associating with particular people? Um, did you find things in their rooms? What were their relationships like? Just so that you have some understanding around uh, your loved one's culture of addiction. And then we've got the culture of recovery. So the culture of recovery, a social network where the group norms are to encourage and reinforce sobriety and lifelong recovery. It is a pattern of perceiving, thinking, feeling, and behaving. So recovery almost becomes a new blueprint, a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a way of acting out. And with the culture of recovery and the culture of addiction, there's specific factors that are greatly impacted by these cultures. And we're gonna unpack them today. 
So the first one is tribes and or families. So in the culture of addiction and the culture of recovery, first we'll start with the culture of uh, addiction. An individual will seek and build relationships which mirror their own drug use. So the drug use and these relationships will be centered around normalizing their usage, normalizing the late nights, normalizing the party atmosphere, and really pr promotes a general acceptance around using, it's okay to use, it's okay to be up for days on end, it's okay to, to binge, it's okay to not, um, you know, uh, think about your responsibilities or your families. It's a gender, it's relationships that promote alcohol and drug use for short-term rewards. So for example, calling a friend up and saying, you know, let's go out on a binge or let's do a few lines. It's, it's working and manipulating towards relationships where the end goal is going to be about using. And then the family system initially is a very unhealthy safety net. So when our loved ones are using, you know, we, we try to protect them, we try, we lock them up, we try to keep them from consequences. And there is a general sense of lack of boundaries within the home, with, within the relationships, and codependency is very rife. Codependency meaning I can't survive without uh, my addict's dysfunction. I need to control my addict, my family members, dysfunction, friend, whatever it might be. And you'll see, I mean, you can, you can think about your own experiences. If you've ever tried to distance yourself from your addict or your, your, your person that was struggling with addiction, you try to distance yourself from the drama, you just distance yourself from trying to take consequences. And there's just, a gentle, not a willingness or a wantingness to be around that person. And then the street or the using family is adopted for the addict when they're in active addiction. So the culture becomes about, you know, the acceptance around using, the acceptance and the, the normalization of using. So it becomes, this is my family. They understand me. You don't understand me. It's that kind of culture. In the culture of recovery, the individual will seek relationships that facilitate the development of recovery plans. So recovery plans such as, when are we going to the next meeting? Um, when are we going to do step work together? Um, are you working with your sponsor? It's that the plan is outlined as this is recovery and recovery is going to be for the rest of my life. It's also about ensuring social networks are conducive to recovery. So a culture of recovery, um, if somebody is in recovery, um, they're going to they're gonna say, okay, I'm not actually going to go to a party where I know there's going to be alcohol and I don't feel comfortable. Or I'm not going to go and spend the day out with a friend that's using because I know I'm going to be tempted or this is an ex-friend that I used to use with. So it's important that the networks, the social networks are conducive to what the person, how the person's trying to live in recovery. And in the culture of recovery, there's an expanded family in the community of recovery, which encourages a continuum of care. So it'll be a family that will say, come, let me pick you up. We're going, we're going to a meeting. Or, you know, let's go and do some service. Or whatever it might be. It has to be conducive to the community or the culture of recovery. The next one is language and literature. So in a culture of addiction, the language and literature will be centered around euphoric recall. So remembering what it was like to get high, what it was like to get, have a binge, and the, the awesome, amazing times. Do you remember that time? It was so amazing. Remember, we, we stayed up all night. We smoked a bong. We smoked, a, we smoked like 10 joints all around euphoric recall and then there'll be stories of hustling how they hustle to you know get the next they sold something or to get the next fix who they had to hang out with who they had to sleep with the stories around has, uh, hustling and the pride and the grandiosity around that 
you know, I was able to hustle. I was able to find a way. I was able to duck and dive, you know, and I, I took some, I stole something and they didn't see me. I was able to, to get away with it. The language is also, you know, a, around being annoyed with the law and being a, 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 a annoyed with the rules and regulations around substance. Um, I know a few years ago, and, and I mean, currently there's been a huge movement for pro-marijuana, pro-weed. And there's a general sense where there's an annoyance with the law for, for not legalizing it, you know, in, in different parts of the world. There's also, as I said, a sense of grandiosity. So a pr pride and, and, and geez, you know, I was able to hustle, I was able to do this. And then there's also like a ridicule of non-users or users of less dangerous drugs. So a lot of people would say, you know, and we find this talk very common in treatment. Well, they'll ask each other, they'll say, so what are you in for? Oh, you're in for weed? No, I'm, I'm, I'm here for heroin. I'm here for crystal meth. And there'll also be talk around, you know, weed not being as um, dangerous as something like heroin or alcohol. Oh, you, you're just here for alcohol, alcohol not being as dangerous. And in treatment, we try to discredit and we, we don't allow any type of euphoric recall or any type of comparisons about how much you use, what did you use, that kind of stuff, because it is very dangerous. It is the culture of addiction. And the culture of addiction, addicts will familiarize themselves with literature that is around the effects of drug usage. They'll be preoccupied with recipes for creating, processing, purifying, and testing drugs. So a lot of times we come in, when, when patients come in or clients come in, we hear them say things like, you know, I know how they, they manufacture marijuana. I know the different types of marijuana. I can tell you something now. It's not as dangerous as you think it is. So it's that kind of talk. They understand how it's made, where it's made, who it comes from. And I think there's some control and the, the belief is around there's some control and there's some awareness of their usage and it all forms part of the denial. So addicts will even familiarize themselves with law books around drug control laws in the country and their rights, how they can talk their way out of being arrested or being prosecuted if they found, for example, if they stopped and they found with the bag or they found with some weed or whatever it might be. And on the opposite end, we've got uh, the culture of recovery where language and literature is centered around discouraging profanity and drug talk. So no euphoric recall, reshaping conversations that are constructive, encouraging, empowering, and based on recovery. The language is treatment-based. So you'll hear us say things like, just for today, da 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 just for today, I'm gonna be where my feet is. That's, that's treatment-based language. Will obviously be the 12-step lingo, it'll be the big book, it'll be Bill W story, this type of literature just to, to educate yourself more about recovery and what recovery actually means and what the disease of addiction means. So I've got a video here um, that just gives you an outline of um, euphoric recall, but I'm not sure if it's gonna if it's gonna play and if you're gonna hear the sound, Kate. So let's just see. It's not playing sound, Green. Okay. There's no sound. Okay, we'll have to move on. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so some of the literature that's, um, you know, just for today is I thought it might be good for us to just um, share with the family members some of the just for today's that we use. So just for today, like a, a mantra or uh, a thought or something that's applicable that we use in treatment. And some of the just for today is that uh, we may give patients or we might use in treatment is things like just for today, easy does it, just for today, let go and let God, just for today, expect miracles, just for today, keep coming back, just for today, if it works, it works if you work it, 
So that's just some of the literature that we use in treatment and some of the literature that patients might use in their recovery. So the next point that's affected by the culture of addiction, the culture of recovery is spirituality and religion. So in addiction, um, there is a sense of belief of a higher power or um, the belief in God, whatever it might be, but there's little thought about spirituality. So a lot of times what we experience what we experience is that um, patients will say, you know, I do believe, or clients will say, I do believe, but, you know, I've just got that void and that emptiness. I feel very distant spiritually from my higher power, from my God, whatever it might look like. And I didn't really pray or I didn't really engage in my spirituality or my religion whilst in active addiction. And this is one of the things that really takes us a toll in active addiction. Whereas in recovery, higher power or God as, as we would understand him and the discovery and, and the experiences and surrendering to a higher power is very important. So if we think about spirituality, spirituality is concerned with human spirit and soul. It is not physical or material things. So the belief in recovery is that you need a power beyond yourself to be able to surrender, to assist, to help you understand, to help you to let go in recovery, for the recovery to be effective. So I did have another video, but the videos are not gonna be playing, so that's okay. So um, the next one is appearances and body image. And I'd like you all to just give a think around, um, you know, what your family or friends, uh, appearances, if they're in recovery, if they're in active addiction, what their appearances are like, what, it, what they were like. And I want you to think about their self-care. When they were sick, did they ever go to the doctor? Did they ever, if they had, like, if they had, if they were chesty, if they had, any type of illness or ailment or bruise or burn or anything like that? Were they ever concerned around their well-being? How, you know, how were they doing in terms of physically, what they looked like, were they disheveled, how they presented themselves? And in, in addiction, there is no room for being aware or, or, or trying to, to groom yourself. Instead, it's ignoring the physical illnesses and the the injuries it's personal care is non-existent it becomes an expectation from families from friends rather from, than a norm within themselves and then grooming is never healthy <coughs> and then in recovery there's a new experimentation and excitement with new images likes or dislikes you know I find people say to me, you know, I actually like, I actually like how I dress. I actually have a new appreciation for my fashion sense, or I find it so exciting to experiment more with how I dress, how I present myself. And then of course, things like becoming a, a professional, getting back into the professional world, they go shopping for workwear, they start cultivating the identity as a professional. They start, and, and, and that goes with, um, you know, how they dress, how they present themselves professionally. And they begin to return to self-care. Another thing that is affected by these two cultures is rituals. So in active addiction, the culture is to wake up and use immediately. So nothing comes before we will usually go to the coffee pot or we'll put the kettle on and we'll go and make ourselves a cup of coffee and that's our daily ritual. A lot of times for addicts, their ritual is to wake up, use, you don't do anything else. Sometimes it's to get high before and after sex. A lot of times you also hear, you know, people say it's the ritual of going to buy the substance or buying to go uh, going to buy the drug so sometimes people get so excited that they'll actually get a bit of diarrhea or they, they, their tummy will run 
because they're so excited about their next high and the ritual of getting their next high. So that might be calling the dealer, telling the dealer where to meet them, getting in the car, driving, driving the same route, um, noticing maybe a poster on their way of going to the dealer, going to where they're going to pick up. So these are all rituals. It's rituals before getting high. Rituals are actually one of the last stages of addiction before behaviors become risky. And this is an important point or factor where, you know, family members and friends will recognize that this, you know, this is actually the time for me to intervene. This is actually, an, if, if I can, or an ex, some type of intervention needs to happen. And when an addict starts being ritual-based, it's no longer experimentation. It just becomes a major part of the daily routine. Whereas in recovery, there's an identification of new rituals and new patterns of behavior. So for example, it might be getting up, reading from the Just For Today book. It might be checking the timetable for the day, what they're gonna do, what time they're gonna catch a meeting, what time they're gonna set aside for um, step work, what time they're going to WhatsApp or call their sponsor. It might be looking at a Just For Today WhatsApp group. It might be messaging members of a recovery group, whatever it might be. And the rituals in recovery, replace, are re, uh, the rituals in active addiction are replaced with healthy patterns of behavior. So the patterns of behavior are more structured, they're more routine-based, they're more predictable. So some of the rituals that we do in recovery and in treatment, and we do it on the group, on the family group, is the serenity prayer. Is that after we're done with um, the family group, we'll close with the serenity prayer. And I've also included just for today's here as well, just as a form of ritual that um, recovering addicts might partake in. Another thing that's affected by uh, these two cultures is work and leisure. In addiction, there's a justification for being absent and late for work. So there's no responsibility taken for why am I, why am I late? Why am I not fulfilling my responsibilities? There's preoccupation around beating drug tests at work, uh, dodging and diving. It's manipulating friends and families, employees and, and, spons and supervisors. It's saying, no, I can't make it. Uh, I've got plans. You know, I can't make it to your birthday party. I've got plans. In the meantime, it's just lies and manipulation around uh, finding time and opportunity to use. It's avoiding consequences at work. It's cre the creative use of accidents, creating accidents, medical issues, and disabilities. The so patterns of resigning or quitting work. What we find a lot in active addiction is that um, individuals will start a new job, they'll find something wrong with it, they'll start with the absenteeism, and there'll be some kind of hearing, or there'll be, be some kind of uh, rep reprimanding by the boss or the supervisor, and they'll resign, or they'll quit work, and they just can't seem to keep a stable job or, or, or keep any stability in their lives. There'll also be things like disciplinary hearings at work. Whereas in recovery, it's redefining the role of the professional person. So with the structure of recovery, you know, there's an implementation of structure in recovery. There's the role of being a professional person, getting up, going to work, having an eight to five, whatever it might be. And it's just defining, redefining that role or creating that role because some people actually have never been able to have a stable job because of their addiction. It's restructuring rituals at work. So when uh, people might leave treatment or rehab, they might, um, they might have spent their, their breaks going to use or to score. They might have gone um, to the bathroom often to try and go, to go and use during work times. And 
one of the challenges is actually keeping focus and keeping a routine so that you don't recreate those old addictive rituals, addiction rituals at work. I mean, with recovery and work and leisure, you've got to consider the cross addiction of workaholism. So, you know, the individual might be so preoccupied with forming and cultivating a professional role that they might become workaholics. And then, of course, it's understanding and experimenting. What do I like? What are my interests? What are my pleasures? What are my hobbies? You know, do I like golf? Do I like tennis? It's almost like a newborn baby having to go out into the world to, to redefine or rediscover or actually just discover what they like, what they don't like. Okay, and then of course, there's values and sex. So in the culture of addiction, what we, we see quite a bit is lots of sexual trauma, there's sexual experimentation, and you know, there's, there's ex sexual experimentation in terms of um, not, uh, not being specific in terms of male or female, there'll be experimentation with multiple partners, having multiple partners, and sex is used as a tool, as a way to manipulate. It's not about intimacy, it's not about love, it's not a healthy sense of sex, of what sex is or what sex should be. It's using people sexually, and there's lots of sexual shame and guilt around the way somebody that is in active addiction or in the culture of addiction may use sex. There's, there isn't a lot of um, health or priority given to the health of sex. In recovery, sorry, I just want to move this, can't see it. In recovery, and we say, it says here addressing sexual trauma and while in treatment, but I mean, the recommendation is that you, you start unpacking your trauma a year, 18 months uh, of clean time, because the belief is that you need to have some kind of stability, you need to have some kind of uh, consistent recovery program for you to actually access and address the sexual your traumas, any type of trauma. And then in recovery, there's some clarification of what sexual orientation, are you homosexual, are you heterosexual, are you asexual, etc. And then it's exploring sexual roles. How do I like having sex? Do I actually enjoy sex? Who do I want to have sex with? And then it's also managing shame and guilt. And then to values. So in addiction, the drug comes first. Our values, are uh, um, our values are compromised, you know, we don't know what our values are, we don't trust anywhere, we don't feel, we numb ourselves when we are in active addiction. And every interaction with every individual might be for the potential to hustle, to get the next fix. There's also the avoidance of responsibility by blaming others. So very much an externalizing process where there's an inability to take responsibility when you're in active addiction. And then there's a general excitement when you take risks. So risk, risky sexual behavior, there's an excitement, there's a high, there's a, around, you know, when am I gonna get, when am I gonna score? When am I, how can I exploit this person? How can I manipulate? It becomes a game and a competition. And then in recovery, Addiction is exploitation, recovery is service to others. A very, very, very important point is that in recovery, you're serving others. It's not about manipulating, it's not about the old behavior, it's not about exploiting our families and our friends. Addiction demands retribution, recovery demands restitution. So recovery is about rebuilding, constructing, building up, empowering, flourishing. Addiction is deceits and manipulation. Recovery is honesty. It's the integrity of honesty. We preach honesty. If you're not honest, if you are not willing to be honest, you cannot do recovery right. Okay, so I had, I had a, a really nice video on Sam's story around, um, you know, and Sam's story showed how 
he transitioned from the culture of addiction into the culture of recovery. And it was a really nice video. So Kate, I don't know if you can play it from your side or if there is going to be some volume from your side. I think it didn't, it didn't play sound wise my side either. So. Okay, so some of the discussion points that are highlighted from Sam's story, and I mean, Sam, if I could just uh, paraphrase Sam's story. Sam started using when he was really young and he sort of identified he's using as initially starting as, you know, peer pressure, wanting to fit in um, and wanting to be part of uh, um, part of a, a system, part of a culture. I think he started around 13 or 14. He started with marijuana. He then describes how he, him and his friends would um, get an older, an older person to try and buy alcohol for them. So he'd manipulate and lie and he'd bunk school or he'd dodge school and they'd go to a friend's house and they'd drink and they'd use and they, and, and he recounts and he recounts how they, they actually thought that they were serving some kind of purpose. They, the way they normalized and the way they reflected euphoric recall was so powerful around you know fitting in we're so cool we've got a specific identity you know we're the weed smokers and for for sam his story went on into his early 20s it really shaped his identity it really affected his identity and it was only until he started seeing the consequences and the destruction of his behavior and this destruction manifested obviously with his family and he started seeing how his his addiction and his usage affected his mum and his dad it affected their relationship um he wasn't able to get a good job because he was so fixated around using and fixated with you know this acceptance and this culture of addiction that he he, he didn't see anything else so for Sam, he recounts how this powerful culture of addiction really impacted him and how it impacted him all the way from his uh, teen adolescence all the way into his 20s, late 20s, and how it actually progressed. So it was a really nice video showing the progression of his disease, but also the progression of his, the culture of addiction. So some of the things that are highlighted as discussion points was how Sam had to go through a sense of rock bottom. So he had to go through a sense of helpless, hopeless, I can't do this anymore, I'm tired, I, I can't go through this pattern, I can't live in this culture of addiction that you know I've built, the behaviors that I've engaged in, the friends that I've had, and it's actually tearing me apart. So he, for him, his rock bottom was seeing his family around him and how his family was destroyed and distraught. And also his rock bottom was losing or not being able to create a sense of identity outside of the culture of addiction. And then when there was an intervention, a family intervention for Sam, the, uh, he, he was first initially, he didn't want to get any treatment for his addiction, he, he then had to get to a point where he was absolutely willing. He had to be, he had to have a sense of willingness. He had to be honest with himself about his life. He had to want recovery. He also had to be, have or experience an out of options, meaning I don't know where to go from here. I feel caged in, I feel I can't escape. Um, similar to rock bottom, but a very caged and, and just overwhelming sense of, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And then Sam then decided out on, along with his family, along with the willingness to seek out help. Okay, so that's me. Are there any questions? Kate, I think we'll take questions now. 
Okay, perfect. <clears throat> perfect. Okay. Any questions? You can put your hand up or you can send through a question. Anything that's not clear? I think it was, thank you, Irene, it was, it was great. Is there anything anybody feels like sharing or discussing in particular? We're also open to, to addressing that kind of thing. One question. Okay. <clears throat> can you hear me, Irene? Okay. Yes, so I can. A, what do you think about keeping people in recovery in some sort of positive activity? Like volunteerism? So I think, I mean, based on, you know, the, the presentation today, I think volunteerism is a great way, a great act of service. Um, I think it's it's also opens up an, an avenue for investigating what am I interested in, you know, a sense of gratitude, a sense of, I mean, there's five principles that we talk about when we talk about um, the principles of spirituality, and one of them is gratitude. And mm -hmm. what better way of showing and experiencing a sense of gratitude with volunteerism and service? Mm. And I think I think often when we move from the the position of of being uh, the culture of addiction to the culture of recovery, I think it's often moving from from the perspective of me myself and I to being more open to looking outward and seeing seeing other seeing other people's positions. So, in keeping positive and and volunteering, we learn to to give as well as receive and that biofeedback loop is positive affirmations for for the individual and their personal growth so it's through through the giving that they then learn to start accepting and seeing themselves rather than me myself and i and you know you, the, the culture of addiction is very much around guilt and shame and I think with positive activities, there's a sense of achievement. There's a sense of, you know, kind of identity around, I'm not all bad. Mm. There's parts of me that are really useful and good and giving and, and a sense of um, community. You can create an, a sense of community when you participate in positive activities because you identify, I mean, in things like volunteering, you identify that a ripple effect. Like if I do good, as you said, Kate, if I do good, mm. it's, it's helping somebody else. No. Any other questions or anything anybody wants to share about where they're at in their journey or any queries they have around their journey? And then I think we can bring it to a close. We'll stick around a bit. Uh, do you, is that another question or the same one? It's another question, you know. I just I just can't type that fast. <laughs> no, 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 um, absolutely. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, you know, in terms of the group, but particularly in like residential rehab, is it possible that that is there a danger of that of that group kind of replacing the one the other group that you had? like the unhealthy relationship with, and you have now another group, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive group. They've got different, different, uh, um, what you call, mm -hmm. objectives, but is it possible that one could latch onto that and become dependent on that group at all? Irene, do you want to 
have a go. Sorry, Dudu, I didn't hear you. You cut out there. Oh. Kate, did you hear Dudu? <clears throat> I did. So th the question was the concern around... Kate, did you hear Dudu? Uh, yes, I did. Can you hear, Irene? Okay, so th the question was Sorry, about... Sorry, Kate, you guys are just breaking up there. Okay. Mm. Can everybody else hear? Yes. yes. Okay. So let me just answer that. Um, so I think the query was around what about replacing the old group with this new group? You know, a sense of community is great as long as it remains positive. There are always concerns when, when you have a community of, of ex-addicts and that kind of thing. But if they are living the culture of recovery, it can be very supportive. There's always a risk. And there will always be a risk that, you know, but hopefully the community in its, in its place at that time will hold each other accountable if they're truly in the culture of recovery. So it should be a positive community as opposed to a negative one. Dudu, does that answer us? Um, yes, <laughs> I see that. I, <laughs> I uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any major concerns, though? I mean, look, you've got to watch behaviors. When, and I suppose when, when you see behaviors reverting back to previous, previous addiction culture, that's when you need to then, then, you know, highlight it or become aware of it or highlight the awareness to it. But when they're living in recovery, the community generally holds itself and that is the culture of AA, NA, all that, that is a very healthy community that uplift each other towards a shared goal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Irene, did, could you hear? Just very briefly, Kate, I, I'm not sure what's happening. You guys are cutting out. Okay, all right. Irene, let's go on to the next, is, is there any more questions? Do do. It's almost like you want them to latch onto the new group, mm. so that they learn the new group's habits, and the new group's way of thinking. But they should also latch onto people that isn't in addiction. Mm. So it's to get the the, the balance. Um, of. <clears throat> but it's the safety, but that's always the problem. Yeah. And I think in, in the recovery one, they learn, they learn to have more self pride in some way. Hence the connections going forward, hopefully are more positive in terms of the connections they're making going forward because they seek out a different relationship as to what they previously sought out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have it. Irene. Okay. Do you have any more questions? No, I think no. We, can, we can close. Okay. So we have run out of time today for today. Changes Rehab, thanks you for joining us at this meeting and we encourage that you keep coming back. The opinions expressed here were strictly those of the person who shared them. Take what you like and leave the rest. Our meetings may confuse, may be confusing, but in time you will begin to understand that recovery is a process and nothing we do or say can bypass that. You may not like us or what we have had to say, but you may grow to love us the same way we can love you. None of us ask for this disease to present itself in our family, but since it is here, and even though we avoid blame, we endeavor to accept that we may have become part of the problem. And it is our personal choice if we are to become part of the solution. Thank you to all who shared and thanks to all who listened. Please keep coming back. It works if you work it. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. The host will now lift the mute button so that we can all Your join Your call has in been placed on hold. Please wait. The serenity prayer. Your call has changesrehab.co.za thanks you for 
joining us and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at 6 p.m. SA time. Please join our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages to receive ongoing recovery messages. Thank you. Thank you. So we're all going to do the serenity prayer. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll just wait for you to unmute everyone. Everyone's unmuted. Okay. One, two, three. God. God. Grant God. God. serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay. Irene, you and I can, and the team can hang around a bit okay. afterwards, but thank you everybody for joining and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.